Never, ever, 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 ever did I even remotely possibly think I would be a songwriter, I would be a singer. Heaven began to, um, to shout out what I was going to do, and hell heard these things, and, and hell started attacking me. The very thing I put in the center of your being is actually a weapon. you got to start using it. I don't think of worship as, as, as sitting behind a piano singing. That's never what I thought of worship as. I have thought of worship as relationship. I'm telling you, when I put my hands on the piano and I sing a song, the enemy backs out of the room. There is something about praise that breaks a heavy yoke. God's heart is to use the worship to give a doorway for the Lord to actually peek in and say, hey, I can, I can take this from you. You have to be willing to bring what you don't know how to lay down to the Lord, even if you're holding on to it, with the willingness to let go of it. This is Worship Is My Weapon with me, Rita Springer. Hey, everybody, this is Rita Springer, and welcome to maybe the new and improved Rita Springer podcast, Worship Is My Weapon. I um, have done podcasting audibly for a while. We're doing a whole new approach with video. And so I was just kind of pondering this whole um, vision and trying to describe in every episode or bring into every episode uh, just the, the truth about how worship really is a weapon. I've been leading worship for over 30 years, writing songs in the church, been in church, on staff, know all the ins and outs of the church and the good, the bad, and the beautiful. And I have come to this beautiful um, understanding of how there is just such a weapon in our worship uh, toward the enemy and to fight back, uh, to regain our destiny, regain our positions that the enemy tries to steal from us. So I just thought it would be really great to maybe start back from the beginning, and I don't think I've ever done this on camera outside of live at an event if I'm telling my story, but I thought I would just tell my testimony where the whole idea of and the understanding of worship as a weapon kind of integrated into my life and really um, revolutionized my walk with the Lord, my relationship with God, how I hear the Lord speak to me. And so, you know, it's always, um, it's always a journey um, listening to people, talking to people, and hearing their stories of coming to Christ. I'm really a firm believer in I, what I know to be kind of the, the right way to say salvation. In the Greek, it's sozo, which is kind of a constant, ever-present tense. So when we use the term, I was saved at this age or saved at this age, um, we're actually using that terminology in the wrong format because it's an ever going, ongoing kind of a present thing that we're doing um, when we're getting saved. And so I started, I'll say I started salvationing. Uh, when I was five years old, I um, invited Christ into my life. I look back on my life and I'm like, I don't really have this uh, sob story about being raised in a non-Christian household. I know many people do. I had the honor and the privilege of being raised in a Christian household, now a religious, um, a little bit demented, dysfunctional household, of course, like most people's stories. But I did have a, um, a father who really, really um, fell in love with Jesus by the time I was born, was really dedicated to the Lord, but had carried a lot of his rage and anger issues into obviously the marriage with my mother and into the raising of the six of us. I have six siblings. We lost a sibling last year in August of 2022, which is very sad for us, but now we're down to five. But we were always three girls, three boys. I'm five out of six. So I'm the tail end of this kind of um, emerging story of two parents who were raised to understand that there was a God, my mother more than my father, I think. But the pattern and the understanding of what they brought to the table in Jesus was what they gave us. And by the time that I was born, my father was caught up into some pretty wild stuff. And in church, I have grown up understanding um, this rush of revival that comes in or this rush of a movement that comes in 
And my dad was the kind of believer that just hopped onto the band or the, 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 the back, you know, uh, bed of the truck of whatever was coming into the church at the time that was the buzz. And so we were drug along with that vision and drug along with this whole kind of crazy, sometimes very religious mentality in these moves of God that also had these standards and these rules and regulations to them. And so I can tell you that I had to push my way through a ton of religion to get to the source of God that was where I was going to find my healing, where I was going to find my consistency, where I was going to find the longevity that I feel like I've, I've kind of grabbed a hold in the Lord, which I think everybody can do it. So a lot of us have these kind of weird backgrounds in religion or, or these really weird kind of um, encounters with church. And there are many, many stories out there that I hear on a day-to-day basis where People maybe went to church uh, occasionally or they were ingrained in church identity and then they left it in their late teens, early 20s because it was just so religious that it didn't hold any kind of um, uh, solid grounding to um, their continuing on in in that belief system. And so uh, maybe, maybe I'm just a miracle. I don't know. I think that that growing up the way that we grew up and some of that systematic stuff that I saw as a kid, I should have run for the hills screaming and never run back to the church. But I just fell in love with the Lord. And the beauty of what I, I, I know as my family is my siblings have really never left the Lord. They're all serving the Lord. They're all in some type of ministry or they have served in the church their whole lives. And I'm super grateful for that because out of our family, I don't think that any of our cousins um, that we grew up with really have that to say about their inheritance or their um, their heritage with the Lord. But, you know, my father was, a, I think he had a major in English and a minor in music. He was a trumpet player. That's where the music side of it came into our lives. My mother was an artist by desire, by... Um, by want. She um, was a cartoonist. She drew. I was told, I remember being little and she told me that prior to really getting married and then she just started having children. We lived in California, Southern California, and she got the opportunity to actually um, be an illustrator for Disney and had to turn that down. She was going to go to Pepperdine University. She had to turn that down once she got married to my dad. And she didn't really realize what she'd married. I think my dad was so full of rage and anger by the time he um, married her still that uh, a lot of the early course of their marriage was him trying to work out his salvation. And so if you talk to my older siblings, their journey with my father is quite a bit different than the nine years that I had with him. He was was gone by the time I was uh, nine years old. He had died of cancer. And that is, I think, where my foundations kind of began to tremble and I started to break into an identity that the Lord actually had to um, really go after uh, me to, to teach me about, hey, look, the very thing I put in the center of your being is actually a weapon. You got to start using it. So we grew up really poor. My dad also in these movements that came into the church... Um, There was a movement called the Name It, Claim It movement. I don't know if that's the right name for it, but that's what we used to call it. Um, And the faith movement was kind of like this faith movement, which there were many beautiful things about movements that come in and they go out of a church. I think revival is amazing. But I always have wanted to find the balance. To me, I say this all the time. If If you ever hear me speak or if you've ever gone to a dive school that I taught for 14 years, I would say this constantly, but I just, balance is my word. Like if, if, the, if I had a favorite word in the English language, it would be balance. And I wanted the balance of, of everything in my life to bring me back to center. I was always the kind of person that was like, I was a why asker. I was always intense with, if there was a question, I would ask a question to a question to a question. And I think the Lord actually really loves that. He has always loved that about me because it wasn't okay if he just, if I asked him a question and got an answer, I had to ask another question to get another answer to get another answer. And so balance was always my thing. I was always like very aware of things that just felt off. 
And I think, again, that's part of the prophetic nature in me. It's part of an identity I had to learn to understand that was in me and that was knit in my bones that I, when I recognize it, had to learn how to walk that out. But I don't know that my dad had a lot of balance. I think my dad had a lot of um, passion and passion without purpose is a disaster waiting to happen. And so he was a lot of the times a disaster waiting to happen. And, um, but there was this passion side of him that I grew up seeing. Now, again, I've got nine years with a father. So at, at nine years, you don't really have a full-blooded identity yet. And then when you're cut off from that as even a, a daughter, there's all these ramifications and all these things that the enemy tried to do and tried to succeed in my life by the absence of, of a father and the learning of abandonment, the, the, um, the learning that when something is taking away, you walk with a limp and you've got to either learn how to walk with the limp for the rest of your life. You've got to compensate with all these different things. And so I'll just say that never, ever, 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 did I even remotely possibly think I would be a songwriter, I would be a singer? None of that was on the table for me. I didn't have a prophet, you know, in all these like crazy meetings that we went to drape, you know, himself over my crib or look at me in a meeting and say, the Lord's called you to this. I don't remember any of that. Maybe if my parents were still alive, they could remember anything like that. But I just didn't. I didn't have that. I hear stories of people that were, were promised things from the Lord when they were little. I just didn't, I don't remember any of that. What I do remember is I remember watching the passion that my father had for the Lord and the tangibility that I saw that he was able to access almost like the hem of God. That actually struck me as powerful. Like that, I was like, there's authority in that. Without even knowing how to say there's authority in that. And so... He was just this radical. I think if he would have lived to, um, to walk out uh, the, the, some of the revivals that we've seen, like um, the Pensacola revival and the Toronto revival and those kind of things, he would have just loved it. Like he would have just, he'd been right in the center of all that stuff. So I, I think that he was always wanting to, to see things happen through what God could do with him. And he had a high, high love and a high level of mercy for the broken. But he didn't actually use a lot of wisdom in how he went about doing that. And, and therein lies, I think, what I was witnessing as, man, this just seems like, just seems a little out of balance. So I grew up in the imbalance of his fractures and learning Christ through the imbalance of how he told us Christ looked. And so I think all of us do that as kids. We grow up under Christian parents if we've had Christian parents. So we tend to see God the way they see God. I, I, maybe this is something that, um, or maybe this is something that many of you parents have done with your kids and you're like, well, I did that with my kid and I don't see that it is a wrong thing. For me, when my son was born, the Lord spoke to me and he just said, hey, don't ever ask me what he's going to become. And that just was like, I was like, wait a second, like every parent asks the Lord what they're going to become. And the Lord was just very, very persistent in that. He's like, I don't want you asking me what he's going to become. And I said, why? I was like, why? Why can't I ask that? And he said, because you will screw it up. You will hear me. And in your excitement of hearing me and your excitement for him to be all of those things, Throughout the growing up of his years, you will proclaim those things over him, and then sometimes you'll get it wrong, and he will live hearing. You know, we see in part, we hear in part. He will live hearing this thing that I told you he was going to be so that he doesn't search me out for his own destiny and that he is, is almost like uh, glued to what you said I said he's supposed to be. He's like, I want him to find out what I'm saying over his life. And I'm like, well, what can I ask you? And he said, ask me the kind of man he'll be. Ask me the kind of character that he'll be. And that's what you pray into him. And so for me, that revolutionized my, my time as a parent because I grew up in this whole thing of if you're in the church, you're going to serve the Lord. Somehow you're going to serve the Lord. Like that's what you're going to do. You're going to serve the Lord. And I had this wild nature like my father in the sense that 
melodies and rhythms that were not in the church um, made sense to me, more than some of the melodies and rhythms that the church was offering. I loved movies. I loved acting. I loved, you know, back then it would have been classified as I love the things of the world. But it really wasn't that. It was like I was looking over at the world and seeing we're supposed to be the people that are right bucked up against the in- creator of the entire universe, but we lack the creative and the world is getting all this creative stuff. And then I was given this kind of, I I'd call it religious banter about how, you know, the, the, the Archangel Michael was, you know, the head of all the music and the arts in heaven. And so when he <laughs> departed from heaven, you know, that's why he's twisted the arts. Whether that's true or not, my 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 understanding was always, yeah, 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 yeah. But if we're believing in God, the creator of the universe, the one that gave all the rights to everything, where every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, why are we giving all of our gifting over to this? And why are we burning things? Why are we saying, no, 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 we can't be compromised by this and we can't be compromised by this? No compromise. I believe in all that stuff. Listening to music that compromises your soul, of course, of course, of course. But it's almost as if everything was tainted that was in the world to separate us from the world when all the Bible was saying was, you know, don't be conformed to the world, but go ye therefore and preach the gospel to the whole world. So if the whole world can't identify Christ in us because we're so religious, they don't want it. So all of these things were kind of like circling in my head as a child, being raised under this kind of strict religious kind of mentality where... Everything that I was feeling I wanted to be, I really probably couldn't be because it wouldn't be honoring of the Lord to be. And so I was strained. I felt always like a sore muscle being strained in some of those things. But I loved my father and I respected my father. And there were parts of his passion and his zeal that I just was like, I, 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 I love that. Like, that makes sense to me. Like, I want to be a renegade. And he was a renegade. You know, master in English, minor in music, taught um, high school English, uh, junior high, high school English. And then he, he went to Fuller Seminary, got a theology degree, and wanted to become a pastor. All he wanted to do was be a pastor of a church. But his message was almost more like, um, you know, like a Jesus Revolution message at a time when when we weren't in the Jesus fully in the Jesus Revolution yet. And so... He was always kind of ahead of his time and his passion and part of his part-time work that he got because he also took this standard that you had to sell everything for the sake of the gospel. And so I grew up in, in the kind of poverty that was extreme poverty because my father, a highly educated man, felt like the religion that he got a hold of said it's... Um, it's ungodly to make a living at a secular job if you're not giving yourself over to the Lord. So because of the mentality that he embraced, that was a religious mentality, we suffered as a family because of some of those things. And that, that'll that mark a kid. Some of you probably have stories like that where maybe even in your, your older years, you're still struggling with those kinds of of memories and those kinds of things. And for me, I just was like, because it was an imbalance anyway, I'm just so thankful when I look back and I'm like, man, the Lord really had my number because I just always ask why and felt, okay, something's not right here. But it wasn't really until I entered into my 20s and my mid-20s that I started kind of gaining some footing, I think, in my healing. And um, there was kind of in my six year, seven year old state, he, my dad would do the, like, he would just, he's, he was a nut job. He was a full blown nut job. And he was such a radical. He wouldn't work at what he really at, was educated to do. So he would go down and he'd volunteer at the drug rehab or he'd volunteer at the hospital where they brought in the alcoholics and the drug addicts that were overdosing and put them in programs. And so Saturdays, at least twice a month, he would drive the local drug rehab bus to our house. And the only reason we really loved it is because it was free food because we were so poor. So he would drive in a van full, a bus full of drug recovery, you know, people that were recovering from drugs and alcohol. And so we would have these barbecues because the facility would, would send up the chips and the burgers and 
we would have this barbecue and we would hang out with the poor and the needy and the drug addicts. And that was my father's audience. Like he gave his life to that. And I think my, my great memory of him in that was most Christ-like. He just would get out of the car and pull the bum in. There are, there are things that I think about now that I'm just like, how many times were, could we have gotten killed on the highway or something could have happened because of the people, the kind of people that he picked up that just, they just weren't safe in a car with a bunch of kids. But he had such a standard for the mercy of God that you could almost feel the protection in the car because he was doing something that the Lord had put on him almost as an evangelist to do. And I marveled at that. Like I, that, those are the things I just marveled at his sheer will to um, give away his life to the poor and the needy. But then the suffering that we had to go through on top of that by being so incredibly poor. And when I say so incredibly poor, um, I just I want to paint a little picture um, about just the, the level of poverty that I, I grew up in. Sometimes I shudder when I think about how normalized it was growing up. But and now again, I don't have any, I don't have any dream to do worship. I'm not in any way on the road of the journey at that point in my life that I'm going to fight hell with my worship. I'm going to learn how to train to, um, to shut hell up when I sing or when I, I lead worship and bring people into the presence of the Lord. I was watching my father actually do what he did in evangelism. And he would go to just these random auction houses and meet these just really strange people. And he would, the things that he would, the places that we ended up living for a long time, we lived in campgrounds because we didn't have any housing. And so we would just pitch a couple tents at a campground. We'd move from campground to campground to campground. So a lot of my early shame and humiliation going to, you know, first, second, kindergarten, first and second grade was because I was, I was called campfire girl because I smelled like smoke. And I smelled like a campfire. And, um, you know, our clothes were never really washed. We would take our clothes in garbage bags every Saturday and we would pile them in the back of our van. Remember, six kids. And we would go to the local laundromat and we would sit all day at the laundromat and wash the clothes, dry the clothes, pile them back in the garbage bags and head home. And that was just our existence. That was normal for me. I didn't know that we were that poor. Um, but we were that poor. Now, my father was an only child, and his parents were um, very well off, but well off in the sense of um, programmed well off. I mean, they you could go into my grandfather's closet, and up on the shelf of his closet were probably 25 to 30 um, Gerber baby food jars full of pennies, nickels, quarters, dimes. So they were the kind of era where you just paid cash for everything. And if you had coins and you just saved them up there and then once in a blue moon, you took them down to the bank and you put them in your bank account. So, you know, my father being an only child, he was such a disappointment to his parents because everything that they trained him to do, he didn't do. My father was a Navy guy. He was in the Navy and fought in the Korean war. He was on a Navy ship and that is probably, I think, the biggest thing that they were ever proud of him in. He was a renegade prior to that. He was kind of an old soul. He always kind of ran with the wrong crowd. And he was uh, the reason why they kind of came to the Lord, because when my father got saved, I don't even know his, his salvation story. But I know that when he met my mother, he met my mother in a church in Pasadena, California, and it was, um, it was announced, like, who's visiting the church on that Sunday morning? And they both stood up. They just happened to be from the same town in um, Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio area. And so when he, my father stood up and said, you know, he was from the Columbus, Ohio, originally from the Columbus, Ohio area. And then my mother stood up, said her name. Her name was Juanita. And um, he said, I'm going to marry. I'm going to marry that woman. And then years later, as a kid, I'm looking through a box of photographs and this photograph kind of falls out and it's this, you know, black haired woman. And um, she looks a little like my mother, but I knew she wasn't my mother. And I flipped <laughs> to the back of the picture and the back of the picture says 
Juanita. And it's with a W, not with a J. My mother spelled her name with a J. And I said to my grandmother, who's this? Because that's not my mother. And she said, oh, we don't talk about her. And she told me this whole story about how that was my my dad's first love. She was a divorcee. She had like a three-year-old. Her husband was like this an abusive guy. My dad and her fell in love. And the reason that he joined the Navy was because they made him break up with her. And so I was like, no wonder on that Sunday morning in Pasadena, California, when she stood up, he was like, I'm going to marry that Juanita. So, and he really got the best of the best because my mom was very different, very opposite of my father, very faithful driven, very Proverbs 31, very submissive in, in the sense of whatever. It, it was a very tough marriage for my mom. I know it was a very tough marriage for my mom, but my mother was just, just the essence of kind. And she would just pray you through anything. She'd just silently pray you through anything. So the dynamic between my evangelistic crazy father who wanted to do evangelism and my prayer-driven intercessive mother who, um, you know, sang in, the, in, you know, had a beautiful voice. My mom had a beautiful voice. But my mom stopped singing because in that day, instead of like working on your teeth, they just took all your teeth out. And she had dentures. And so one morning in one of her glorious solos, her dentures fell out and she never sang another solo in church again. But I, as a child, would love to lean my, my head on her back and listen to her sing during church because she had this lovely voice. But because she was just such a beautiful person, it never dawned on me, like, I want to sing like my mom. My sister, my oldest sister, the firstborn, had an insane voice, had an insane ability to play the guitar. She was an insane songwriter. And I looked up to her. And so she really taught me everything I needed to know early on about music. She was a folk writer. She's a very, um, Joni Mitchell, all the 70s. I can't even think of half the, half the uh, 70s uh, records that I would listen to. But she was just like, she, was a, she loved folk music. Little Janis Joplin here and there. But she loved that era of folk music. And she was the one musician in our family. So if I, if I said... Gosh, there was the the spotlight of of the music in our family. It was my my oldest sister Debbie had that, and she did that as an escape because she and my father had a disastrous relationship. But my dad ended up meeting this guy, and we ended up caretaking this three hundred and fifty acre ranch that had a house on it that at that time was a fifty year old redwood house that was falling apart. The water had to be pumped up from the field. So you had to actually turn a pump on in the house to pump the water from the field into the house. So there were a lot of cold winter mornings when the pump would freeze and we had just no water. Like we had to just jug in water in old milk jugs. It was poverty at its greatest. There were rats in the walls and snakes in our cupboards. So my mother, there were certain cupboards in our living room that my mother was like, just leave that cupboard closed because there's gardener and king snakes in there. And she was like, just leave them in there, let them nest, because they eat the rats in the walls. So, and I know that's just like, it's crazy, but that's what I grew up under. And when I look back on that, I'm like, I think it shaped who I am. I think it shaped my generosity. I think it shaped um, how I see people. It, I think it shaped how I respond to the poor, how I respond to the needy, because I grew up in it. And I grew up in learning that more wasn't necessarily more of what you wanted, but more was something that you had to go after in what you needed for your soul to survive. But it was a rough childhood. It was a rough growing up childhood. But then you think I had 350 acres to dream on, 350 acres to run wild in. And that's what we did. I was six years old, seven years old. I knew how to saddle a horse and my brothers taught me how to shoot a gun because there were rattlesnakes everywhere. You had to know how to shoot a rattlesnake if you came upon a rattlesnake. I mean, it sounds nuts. Would never let my kid ever have done that when he was that age. But that was our existence. It was the Bonanza era, the Big Valley era. It's the Little House in the Prairie era, and that's what we lived. We lived on the Ponderosa, and we lived like this was never paid a dime for the property. It was an old horse racing facility back in the, um, the 40s and the 50s. And it was just our playground of playgrounds. And that's where I would dream all over the place. I would dream all over the place. And we'd get up on summer mornings and we'd leave and we wouldn't come back until we could hear our mom shouting from the porch, you know, when it was just about to get dark. And I think it's there that I probably wrote a million songs that I never thought would go ever go anywhere. I wasn't thinking I was a singer. 
I was acting in the woods because I was going to be an actress. If I thought about anything, it was I was going to be an actress. I was going to go to Hollywood. I was going to be an actress. And if I sang, it's because I sang show tunes. And I knew I was going to win a Tony Award when I got on stage one day. And so that's when music entered my life. But um, until my father died, I didn't feel the full-blown fracture of, um, of the things in my life that would actually start deterring me away from uh, ever doing anything for the Lord in ministry. Uh, because I, you know, I really feel like when we're born, all of us, hell her- hears a rumor of what we are to become. Hell hears heaven's rumor of what our destiny is. And so when we're, when we're born, hell launches an attack on us to try to get us to stay in a place where we never see the promises or we never see the destiny that heaven is speaking over us. And I believe that's what happened. I believe when I was born, heaven began to, um, to shout out what I was going to do. And hell heard these things and, and hell started attacking me in these ways. And I say that because it just got uh, it just got almost comical later on looking back at my life and thinking, wow, like my voice was something that the Lord was always going to use. And it was one thing that the enemy assaulted over and over and over and over and tried to get me to actually destroy my voice. In fact, when I was younger, I fell um, as a little toddler and I think I broke my nose. It's why I have a bump in my nose. And later on, when I went to an ENT specialist, he said, yeah, it looks like there you broke or fractured your nose when you were younger. And I remember when it happened. And he said, that's why it's pitched your vocal cords down and you have a lower voice. But he said, if I were to ever operate on your deviated septum, he said, I would run the risk of changing the sound of your voice. So I've never had my nose worked on because I never wanted to change the sound of my voice, which when he said to me, you know, Barbara Streisand never had her nose done for that very reason. I was like, yeah, no, we're not doing this. So there were even things in the course of my life that happened that that I, I think were allowed by God because God obviously knew that there was this plan, that the texture of my voice, the sound of my voice would have its own thing. And it had to have that thing in order to accomplish what it was supposed to accomplish. But it got a little bit uh, sad when... In this religious platform that my father was on, he finds out that he's got cancer. And back then, cancer, you know, um, we had chemotherapy. We had those things um, not as far along as they are now in the medical um, field um, at helping things or in surgery. But my father heard the diagnosis cancer. And because he was on the the train of the name it and claim it, he just was like, the Lord's going to heal me. I'm just going to proclaim healing and the Lord's going to heal me. Do I think that things like that happen? Absolutely. I'm a full-blown believer in, in praying and believing God can heal you. I just am also a believer in asking God where the wisdom lies. Do, do you get the medical um, intervention? Do you do this? Do you do this? Is God using medical intervention to actually help us prolong and, and get to the healing? And those are things my father didn't even ask, which is part of his kind of crazy behavior. Um, And he took us aside in the course of his not getting any kind of help, medical attention, and the cancer spread throughout his body. I think by the time that he was given the diagnosis of months to live, he took each of us aside separately. None of us knew this until we were adults. But I remember he took me into a room and he just said, I was seven, and he said, um, if you pray for me, the Bible says that God's going to heal me. And I'm thinking, I've, I've watched this guy disappear from our house and have our mother tell us he's on these prayer journeys with God. And then when I'm out riding my horse, I find him um, fully naked, face down in the dust, throwing heaps of dirt on his back while he's quoting chapters of Isaiah and thinking to myself as a young girl, I think my dad is like a reincarnated version of Moses. So everything he said was God. Everything he said was like, I mean, he talks to God in the wilderness. Who am I to question 
whether or not this is right or wrong. And so I just prayed. I prayed. I asked God to do what only God could do, never thinking that God would ever not respond. And God didn't respond. He didn't heal my father. My father died um, in the house while I was at school one, one day. And out of the six of us, again, because I'm such a, uh, I have to know everything. I have to be in there. I wanted to know what was going on. I wanted to know how to, you know, um, help um, care for him. I wanted to be in there when he needed somebody to always be in there with him. And just if I was just sitting in a chair, rocking back and forth. And, and so um, he dies when I'm at school one day. I'm nine years old. And um, I, I come back and my mother just sits us down on the couch and she's like, your father went home to be with Jesus today. And it was said in, in a, a precious manner, but it was said in a manner of that's the end of the story. Like that's the end of the story. Like there's nothing else to question. There's nothing else to talk about. Um, he's done this thing and he's, he's home. And I'm at nine years old thinking, wait a second. Like I was, I was brought into a room. I was asked and told to pray for him because the Bible says, if I pray for him, God would heal him. Why didn't God heal him? And so I'm circling with all of these questions with absolutely no answers. And that is where I talk a lot about the beginning stages of fracture. Now, psychologically in, um, in therapy, and when we read psychology books, we understand that the identity of a child between the ages of one th- to five years old, your identity is pretty much built in. It's, it's there. If trauma happens prior to five, your identity is learning its identity through the base and through the volume of, of trauma. But when trauma happens after five, your identity then has to um, actually kind of formulate itself and adapt itself to what's happening, the circumstances that are kind of happening around you. And so I had all this passion. I had all this kind of wild nature in me, but there was this sudden kind of abrupt stop to, I don't understand this side of God. And this is, this is not, I don't like it here. And so how do I overcompensate for that with what I don't understand? And so I just said to myself, I have a father. He's my grandfather. My, my father's father, in all the mistakes he made with my father, he overcompensated for that with the six of his grandkids. So he was Hallmark grandpa. He was the Hallmark grandpa of everything. Never judged, never said anything bad. Loved us in spite of our messes. He just was the patient, kind grandpa that you see on Hallmark commercials. And so I said, he'll just be my dad. So I, I remember saying, I just need a dad. I just need a dad. I'm not going to talk to that guy because that guy, I've done something wrong with that guy. He's not in- answering my prayers. And so I'm going to just go after my grandfather. So essentially, I'm just transferring what I don't understand and trying to just fix what it is I now don't have. And so I put all of that on my grandfather. Um, my father died in October of 1976, and um, my grandfather had a heart attack in February of 77 and died in the middle of the night. And so just about four or five months later, the, this, the, the father that I'd put everything on was, was gone in the middle of the night. So as a nine-year-old, I'm thinking... I didn't accomplish the prayer for my father the way I was supposed to do it to keep him alive. So I'm not allowed to have a father. And I pulled that in. And when I pulled that in, it was almost like, um, you know, when you're driving down the highway and a rock hits your windshield and you see the, the impalement of the rock in the windshield. And if you don't take your car in to get that hole filled, your whole windshield starts to, to crack. And so there, in I think for me was the beginning stages of what I call the fractures of trauma that create this um, survival in us that now we're racing just to survive. We're just racing to survive through what we can't understand. We're racing to survive through what we don't, um, we, we can't process. We're too young to process that stuff. A child is not, 
um, able to process their stuff. And when people say a lot, children are so resilient, they're so resilient. I don't think it's they're resilient as much as they just do not have the tools to process the trauma that sometimes is there. So for me, um, my, my encounter with the Lord kind of stalled at the um, absence of both fathers in less than a year. And I did kind of three, three times as, you know, three, three times as a charm, I guess, where my older brother in internally, I just looked at my older brother, never said a word to him and said, I'm just going to look at him. He's going to be the next dad. And he was dating a girl. And very shortly after that next year, he ended up getting married and he moved seven hours away. And I was kind of left at the house, 10 years old and thinking, I, I don't know God. I don't know how to know God. And so that is when I started walking in the mentality of, I'm not worth God's attention. I'm not worth God ever coming and saying anything. I'm certainly not worth intercession. I'm certainly not worth prayer. And part of that understanding of me, pulling that into me, created this splinter effect that um, was a hell's delight to get me to be so distracted that I would not even consider that I would do ministry, that I would sing for the Lord, that I would write about those things, um, and that one day I would write songs about those things that would actually bring people back to an understanding of the goodness of God. And so um, that's where I segued into, okay, how do I do this limping, not trusting God, trying to figure out where the Father's heart of God is with a splintering windshield that's having fractures. And what happens, I think, with us in our traumas and stuff that we deal with as children is that when the rock hits the windshield and the fractures occur, the, the fractures start splintering off to just those survival skills, which cause us to try to figure out how we're going to survive on this and how we're going to survive on this. And a lot of that leads to addictive behavior. And that is kind of what happened. I just went into an addictive behavior of surviving because there was a trench of trauma and a trench of grief that I was unable to fully process. In the next episode, which will be part two of uh, the testimony here, and how I really gained the understanding of worship as my weapon, we're going to talk about just my introduction into taking piano lessons and how the piano lessons actually became the tool that God used to begin to lead me into a place of reckoning and into um, the presence of the Lord that just, yeah, it just wrecked me. And that's when I began, even as an 11, 12 year old, to understand, I think, I think God's giving me something here to survive, to survive this. And that'll be in part two. We'll talk about that in part two.